Tonight, we bless you and we honor you. We thank you that we can be in the house of the Lord tonight. Father, we thank you for the blood of Jesus, Father God, that rescued us, that redeemed us, that healed us, that delivered us and set us free. We thank you and we don't take the blood for granted. Father, we thank you that tonight, Father, we will hear from you. Father, I thank you that my tongue will be that of a ready writer to speak whatever you want to speak Oh, whatever heaven wants to say. Holy Spirit, I thank you. You're unplugging every ear. You're unveiling every eye. And you're creating in every spirit a hunger for what you have to say tonight. In Jesus' name, somebody say amen. Amen, amen, amen. amen. Y'all can be seated. I don't think I'll need that tonight. But we'll see what happens. Amen. So there's some entrepreneurial entrepreneurial opportunities. If anybody wants to start a kayaking taxi business up and down 78th Street, you might you might get some good business half of the year. Amen. It's not not a bad not a bad idea. Hallelujah. I want to thank my husband, my pastor for the opportunity tonight to be able to minister the Lord's word. And um, yes, thank you to everybody who's tuning in online. Please like, subscribe, and share. Get it out there so the word can be heard by all who need to hear. Um, Let's go. And listen, I'm just going to preface this, y'all. I know you're all into the yes, and I I appreciate that. But tonight, you don't have to worry about that. It's going to be just like a little fireside chat, little Bible study tonight. Is that okay? Okay, we're going we're gonna to get you all ready for Bible study. Amen? That's coming up. All right. So you can say, yeah, like under your breath if you still really feel the need to say it. But I'm really okay with tonight with just being able to go through it. Amen? All right. Plus, it's even better when the youth are in here because then you can get them to do it. But since they're, they're being ministered to, we, we're just going to keep going through the message. Amen. So... Jeremiah 17, 9 through 10 says this. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. In the Amplified, it says this. The heart is deceitful above all things and is extremely sick. Who can understand it fully and know its secret? motives. I, the Lord, search and examine the mind. I test the heart to give each man according to his ways, according to the results, according to the results of his deeds. More scripture, Matthew 4, 4, in the King James says this, but he answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. In the Amplified, it says, but Jesus replied, it is written and forever remains written. Man should not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. How many of you guys have had to make decisions in your lives? Anybody had to make a decision? Okay. How many of you have trusted in your heart when you've made those decisions? How many of us have testimonies of how those decisions may not have been the right decisions? Okay. Point proven. We can all go home now. (laughs) Tonight, I believe the Lord wants to solidify us in his word, in his truth, in his way of making a decision. Amen? So the message the Lord gave me is is called, You Decide. You Decide. So Pastor Tony just recently ministered about the power of God's word, and I believe that God's not really done with that, um, and done with showing us the power and exposing the lies of our feelings and emotions. Amen in the house tonight. And guys, it's not just for ladies. Just letting y'all know that. So can the Lord teach you tonight through me? 
Is that okay? So I'm going to teach, I'm going to let him teach you guys how he teaches when I do gatekeepers. So it's just going to be real laid back tonight, but it's going to be foundational. Amen. So we're going to reread. I'm going to put this down here because the air's not blowing as hard. Amen. We're going to reread the first opening of verse uh, again in Jeremiah 17 in the King James. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. Now, before I go into this, I'm just going to share. I think sometimes uh, we withhold to detriment. And so I can honestly stand before you. I've been at the Lighthouse for almost 20 years, which is just a crazy thought in and of itself. Um, but I've been here almost 20 years. And I can honestly say that when I lived in, I lived in Pennsylvania, the right side of Pennsylvania, Lynch will appreciate that later, um, right outside Pittsburgh. And um, this is a word for men and women, women and men, men and women, and the congregation, that when you make decisions based on feelings and emotions and you ignore things that the Lord is trying to show you, it doesn't end up just being a bad decision for you. It affects everything and everyone around you. Can somebody say Amen. Okay, so my bad decision in ignoring all the red flags stemmed out of my own insecurity, and I've said it here before, this is part of my testimony I share frequently here, that it led me to a place of um, ignoring red flags. Uh, And I got into a relationship with our daughter's biological father. And I did that because I was insecure in me. So based on those broken emotions and feelings, I looked at him and said, oh, there's a football player. He's a college football player. And, oh, everybody knows him and likes him. And you know what? He's, attra- Look, he's attractive. He's a Christian. What? He's giving a testimony in chapel. <gasps> right? So I fell after that. Instead of looking at God going, boop, red flag. Boop, red flag. And then eventually, hey, is anybody listening out there? Right? And I still didn't listen. And when, so God had delivered me out of my own addiction and out of my own mess, right? And I've ignored all the red flags and got into a relationship, eventually into a marriage relationship with somebody who I had to go down the road of addiction with him. Because I didn't listen to the word of God, I listened to my feelings and my emotions. Reins. So in the the opening scripture, it says, I try the reins. The Lord says that. I try the reins, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. Reigns, it means this, the seat of emotions and affections. It can also mean the mind. So if we insert that into the verse that we just read, it'll read like this. I try the seat of emotions and affections. I try them. The Lord is looking. The Lord is trying them to see where they are, what's driving them, what's the driving force behind them. Heart, in that same verse, The heart is deceitful, means mind, will, and understanding, the soul of man, and again, the seat of emotions and passions this time. So again, if we insert it into that verse, it would read like this, the seat of emotions and passions is deceitful above all things. Put your seatbelt on, tell your neighbor, click it. Thank you for the sound effects. In the Passion, it says this, there is nothing more deceitful than the heart of man. Who can understand it? Man's heart is sick in need of healing. I, Yahweh, probe the heart and thoroughly test the inner being. The footnote in the Passion says this, this is the Hebrew word akab. I have no idea if that's the right way to say it, but hey, we like to sound fancy up here. So the Hebrew word is akab which comes from a verbal root that means to take by the heel or to supplant, and from which we derive the name Jacob. Every person has a Jacob life in them, a life that cannot be trusted, for it plots ways to get what it wants. 
Only the life of Christ within us is the life that pleases God. That's what the footnote says. A Jacob life living in them that can't be trusted, it plots ways to get what it wants. I figured it out. I'm going to ignore this. I'm going to override this. I'm not going to listen to this person. The pastor even looked at us that was marrying us, looked at us one time. We walked into pre-marriage counseling and said, do you guys even like each other? And I still didn't listen. I will say this, though. Praise the Lord for my testimony because now I have a man after God's own heart that loves the Lord, that's... <laughs> that serves the Lord, that is humble in all his ways, <laughs> and that loves me greatly. Yes, you can definitely praise the Lord for that. But I didn't have to go through all that, right? Um, praise the Lord. Okay, so the footnote, in the, another footnote in the Passion that talks about the heart it says this, the hearts of men and women can be so deceitful that only God's searching gaze can uncover and heal. Deceitful means this, sly, insidious, slippery, fraudulent, polluted, crooked. So if we're going to insert that into the Passion verse, how it read in the Passion, it would read like this. There is nothing more sly, insidious, slippery, fraudulent, polluted, or crooked than the heart of man. But yet, this is how we make decisions. This is what we trust to make everyday decisions and major life-changing and life-altering decisions. I'm pretty sure the Lord had a different plan, right? He had a different plan in mind for us, and I'm pretty sure this is why many of us commit spiritual abortion. We're led by our heart, our feelings, our emotions, our affections, instead of something that's everlasting and hasn't changed in thousands of years. Matthew 4, 4 again says this in the King James. But he answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. The problem in the body of Christ is that we have moldy bread. That was almost the title of the message, but praise the Lord, he gave me something else. <laughs> I'll preach about moldy bread. Think about it, though. Stop and think, how does bread become moldy? Think about it. You open up the bread bag, get a couple pieces out or a piece out, and then you let it sit on the counter for a few days, and you don't touch it. You don't use it. And the next thing you know, you go, and it's got little white circles starting to form on it. That's when it gets moldy. It's sitting there and it's not being used. It's been opened, but it hasn't been used in quite a while. So that's what's happened in the body. With all the apps, with all the podcasts, with all the YouTube messages, we opened the bag last month, but we haven't touched it since. Listen, I was so refreshed last week. Was it last week? Sure. It might have been this week. I, I'm pretty sure it was last week. Um, when we met with a couple of members, and they said that they spent several hours searching the scripture for themselves to see if what Pastor Tony was preaching was true, because it was contrary to what they had come to believe for so long. But when they did search the scriptures, they found out that what he was preaching was true. It was the word. But they went and searched it out for themselves. They went and took what was being preached from the pulpit and said, wait, let me check this out and make sure it's okay. And it was an insane amount of time they said they searched the scriptures. It was, it was so refreshing for our pastor hearts to hear that that is actually happening. That people want the truth. They go to search out what is in the word and they're not just taking our word for it. We can get up here and be like, the sky is purple. You're like, no, the sky is blue. No, the sky is purple. And then you'll be like, oh, well, the sky is purple. No, search it out for yourself. So let me just say this to the Faith Home students real quick, that I want to say this. Don't think just because you sit in class or you go to chapel or you come to church that you're opening the bag for yourself. That time doesn't count. Just FYI. 
the time you spend in class and the time you spend in chapel, that doesn't count for you opening the bag for yourself. What are you doing outside of those times for yourself? What are you, what are you doing, working students and interns? When was the last time you got up early, took your lunch break, cracked open your Bible for yourself to study, to meditate, and to read? I'm trying to step on your toes. Because you will not make it if you don't open it for yourself. But congregation, is the same for you. Everybody watching online, it's the same for you too. When was the last time you heard one of us minister or heard something on YouTube and actually studied it out for yourselves? When was the last time you studied to see if what, <laughs> what we were preaching was actually the truth and it was found in the word and not some fancy, fandangled words that we can come up with? I can stand up here with my master's level education and come up with all kinds of tiered leveled words to try and confuse you and impress you and make it sound so great and so mighty. But it means absolutely nothing if it doesn't line up with the word of God. You have to search that out for yourself. Take notes. Then the next day on Thursday, on, on, from Sunday to Monday, take, take time on your lunch break. Study out the message again. Look up the scriptures for yourself. Write out the whole scriptures. Do it for yourself. What is he trying to say to you personally? The verse in Matthew says that we don't have to, <clears throat> excuse me, that we don't live by what everyone else is teaching us that the word says. It says that we personally live by every word. That proceeds from the mouth of God. This right here contains all those words. You have to open this to get the words. You can't escape it. I don't care if you've never been a student. I don't care if you hated school. I don't care if, you know, reading is not your thing. I don't care. God doesn't care. Get a version that you understand. Get a version you understand. Get a paraphrase like the passion. Get something that you understand. Open it because you're not going to get an excuse just because you don't like to study or you don't like to read or you think you can't understand. You, the word says that you have the mind of Christ. You can study. You can read. You can comprehend what he's trying to say to you. There's no hall pass in heaven. You don't get skip class in heaven. But when you get there, you're going to be totally flabbergasted by what you see if you don't start reading the word and know what to expect. So it's time for the body to return to the word of God to guide and direct us in every aspect of our lives. Instead of being led astray by every wind of doctrine and making decisions based on what feels good or what agrees with our emotions. John 1.1 1, 1 says this. In the beginning, before all time, was the Word, Christ, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God himself. And the Word, Christ, became flesh and lived among us. And we actually saw his glory. I'm sorry. I'm skipping into the next scripture. That is my bad. It all just flows so wonderfully together. Okay, so John 1, 1, period, says, In the beginning, before all time, was the Word, Christ, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God himself. John 1, 14 says, And the Word, Christ, became flesh and lived among us, and we actually saw his glory. Glory as belongs to the only one and begotten Son of the Father, the Son who is truly unique, the only one of his kind, who is full of grace and truth, absolutely free of deception. So as much as you might like to separate Jesus, God, and the Word, so you can continue to live in a land of butterflies and unicorns and rainbows and sit on a cloud, you can't. You can't separate the Word from Jesus. You can't separate Jesus from the Word. This is the emphasis that he puts on his Word. Psalm 132, Psalm 138, verse 2 says this, I will worship toward thy, toward thy holy temple and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth. For thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. For you have magnified your word above your name. He has placed his word higher than food, higher than his very own name. That's the value he placed on it. 
So what's the value you place on it? He places so much value that when the word says, at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord, and that doesn't mean that everybody's going to be saved. It's not what that scripture actually means. But when it says that, he's saying, okay, you can cry out on the name of Jesus, but I hold my Bible, I hold the word higher than the name of Jesus. That's the value he places on it. It's higher than his name. What is the value we place on it? I told you, it's a teaching tonight. We have to get rooted and we have to get grounded because the world is not going to change. And when the world comes after the church, we have to be able to stand, know what the word says because we're not fighting flesh and blood, and go and fight and pull down strongholds and principalities and powers. Amen? Jesus gave us an example when he was being tempted by the devil himself. Please do not turn out, tune out tonight. Bless you. Jesus was being tempted as a man, not as God. I'm going to say that again, and I say it frequently throughout the year, especially when we get closer to Easter. But Jesus was tempted as a man, not as God. When he faced temptation, and even when he was crucified, he was not doing it as the Son of God. He was doing it as man. But even while that was happening, he had to choose on how to handle that temptation. As a man, he had to choose whether he was going to handle that temptation in the realm of the spirit and call down legions of angels, or if he was going to handle it in the realm of being a man. He had to make the choice. And how did he do it? With the word. He didn't fight temptation with something he heard from somewhere else. He didn't say, well, on YouTube, I heard that. Well, at this church, they said that, well, Pastor Tony said that, Pastor Jeanette said that, that's not what happened. He didn't fight it with a goose bump or oil being poured all over him. He didn't choose to fight the temptation by having someone else pray for him to overcome it or have someone pray for him that it would stop. He used the word. He didn't stay silent. He spoke the word out of his mouth. And he did it this way so we could imitate him. We could imitate his example, and so we would be able to identify with Jesus in temptation. He didn't want Jesus to be so far off that we wouldn't be able to reach him or touch him. He made it so that when Jesus was tempted, we would be able to identify in that temptation because he was tempted as man. And it's all the areas. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. He was tempted in all those areas just like we are. And he didn't pull out some secret weapon that we don't know about. He used the word. And just like it was his decision on how to fight that temptation, it's ours as well. You don't think his feelings were telling him to do the things that the devil was telling him to do? You don't think his mind was wanting to give in and his body wanting to yield to make it all stop? He was being tempted after not eating for 40 days. This wasn't a 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. 21-day fast. This was 40 days of abstaining. His body was weak. He was a man. He was hungry. He was frail. This is a commentary um, that, that says this, this way about all of this. Jesus used scripture to battle Satan's temptation, not some elaborate spiritual power inaccessible to us. Jesus fought this battle as fully man and drew on no special resources unavailable to us. Outflash the sword of the Spirit. Our Lord will fight with no other weapon. He could have spoken new revelations, but chose to say, it is written. He could have stood against Satan with a display of his own glory. He could have stood against Satan with logic and reason. Instead, Jesus used the word of God as a weapon against Satan and his temptation.
He chose to face it out as a man, and then he chose to use the word of God. Not something that we can't do. Not something we don't know how to find. Matthew Henry said it this way, The wonders of grace exceed the wonders of nature. And what is discovered of God by revelation is much greater than what is discovered by reason. What is discovered by searching out the scriptures is much greater than what is discovered by reason. So when it comes to making decisions, we have to think about the scripture in Ephesians 6. In Ephesians 6, 13 through 17, it says this. Take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. I was sharing with the, the couple we were meeting with that um, I had a gatekeeper recently come up during praise and worship, and she had discovered something in her word. And, you know, we, we get into our own little thing over here and, and enter into his presence and do warfare and all that stuff that we, we do during praise and worship. And she came up, and I was like, hi. But she had, a, she had something caught her eye in the word, and she had a question about it. And I was like, this is beautiful. Like, this is what I want. I want them to get into the word. I want them to have questions about the word. I don't care if I'm on my knees in an intimate moment. If they want to know something about the word, I want them to know. I want them to be hungry. I want them to be thirsty because that word is the only thing that's going to keep them when they go back outside these four walls. And she's like, well, I just don't understand why they did that. I'm like, well, here, let me explain this. And she was so grateful. But you know what that does? That makes her hungry for more. That makes her want it more. So when you find something in the word and you have questions about it, mark it. Write in your Bible. I encourage everybody to write in your Bible. Our son looked at us the other day and was like, who doesn't write in their Bible? I'm like, well, I know people who don't write in their Bible. And that's okay. But I encourage you to underline, put a question mark by it, make notes, ask leadership. If leadership can't help and you're not in the faith home, then you go online and you try and search out commentaries. Man, listen, before the internet, let me tell you, all you had was a concordance and your Bible to find scriptures. And the concordance nine times out of ten wasn't even the same version of your Bible. So you had to like figure out where things were and it didn't make any kind of sense. And then you got really deep and you got um, a commentary. And so you had like three books out and you're like reading the scripture and you're trying to find, okay, wait, that's not the right verse. Okay, that one says this one. I'm going to flip, 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 find it there. Okay, now I'm going to go to the, uh, the, the commentary. What does it say? Okay, and write it out. Study it. Study it for yourself. It's exciting. What does that word actually mean? Like now we have apps. You can download the Blue Letter Bible. Blue Letter Bible is a beautiful thing. It's got commentaries. It's got everything on it. You can just do it on your phone. I'm not the person to use my Bible on my phone. I want to see it. I want to feel it. I want to read it with my eyes. But I'm just letting you know it's so easy now. It's so easy. There's 50,000 versions. And then there's another one called My Sword, My Sword Bible. And it gives you, man, after one verse takes up like this much space because it gives you the opportunity to see what the words mean in the original language. So, like, I, yeah, I just get lost sometimes. Um, my Sword? No, it's not your sword. My Sword Bible. Blue Letter Bible and My Sword Bible. I don't use used version. I know a lot of people do, but they invited some woke people to put some devotions on there, so I don't want any mixture. Amen. So, but it's all right there, and you can get lost in it. Like, okay, I've heard this scripture my whole life. What does it actually mean? What does it mean not to live by bread alone? What does that mean? Anyway, okay, so Ephesians 6. 
Praise the Lord. The word is the sword of the spirit. So today, it was a very interesting day before the skies opened. Amen. Um, very interesting day. And as I was sitting there in my office, I was like at home. I'm like, sword of the spirit. And literally, the Lord gave me the image of a machete. Okay, we know a sword, right? We know, we know a sword. But he gave me a machete. So I likened all of this to a machete. Uh, why? Because the Lord showed me. Um, but he showed me that in the word, when being used to make a decision, just like a machete can clear the way and create a path through overgrowth, weeds, and damage caused by pests, too many opinions, too many voices, our own feelings, our affections, is the same way the word of God can be used to clear the way, to make a path, to defeat all the other things, to silence the voices, to silence the opinions, to silence the lies, and to get the truth in. So when we're making decisions, we use a machete. We use the sword of the spirit to clear out the way. Not because you're on the back 40 for punishment, Faith Home. Amen. Probably swim back there now. <laughs> okay, so the heart's decisions, when we make decisions based on our hearts, it can be based on our own human inclinations, situations, circumstances, environments, others' input. The word is based on truth. Period. The truth transcends human limitations. Now listen, your heart's judgment may get clouded by people that are involved in that situation or circumstance. It may get clouded by your preferences and your feelings. But once you get a word on it and you allow it to penetrate through all of that overgrowth, that's all it takes. Let me share this with you that back in the day, there were some things going on um, with one of our children. And I was like, Lord... I'm ready to go to battle. Like, show me, show me how to win this battle in prayer. Show me how to win this battle on my knees. Show me how to use the weapons you have given me. And so what happened is I just started listening. I started praying in the spirit, and then I was quiet. And he gave me because I asked, right? Ask, seek, and knock. When you ask, he's going to give. He doesn't withhold from his children, especially when they desire to know truth in their inward parts, right? So he gave me two notebook pages full of scriptures that to this day I still use for both of our children. And then recently something else had happened and I was like, I'm not going through this again. But he showed me that those scriptures, although fine and great and they're still weapons of warfare, this is a new season and it requires different scripture. And he gave me another two pages, almost to the point where like, I'm just anal. I don't want to flip to one page and just write one line on it. So I'm just like that. So he gave me two pages, and I've got, like, stuff written on the side because I'm like, I'm not turning the page. I should have because I ended up with more stuff. But So I ended up with another two pages. So I have four pages of Scripture to declare over our children that the Lord gave me. I didn't ask somebody. I didn't ask Pastor Tony. I didn't go to anybody else. I asked the Lord, and when I asked him, he gave me because he wants, just like that gatekeeper came up and she wanted to know the truth, I want the truth because I want to be able to stand when it gets a little cloudy and things look a little crazy and maybe one of the kids is making a crazy decision that we don't agree with. I can go to war not against my child, but in the spirit against the influence that's trying to push them in that direction but it's the same way it's the same thing for your marriages it's the same way for your adult children it's the same way while you're here and you're trying not to receive from leadership because it hurts it grates it's annoying listen it's the same for everybody faith home student congregation member it's the same he wants you to open that bag and get out the bread and get hungry for what he wants to say to you. 
Nine times out of ten, we fall, we get tripped up because we don't know what the word says. And then our situations and our circumstances look bigger than God. Or we get a little piece of offended and don't really know what the word says. That the word is supposed to come at you like that. When you get your word on it, you become unmovable and unshakable in your decision and in any type of temptation you may face. Listen, I'm not here saying it's, it's always easy. I'm not, I'm not saying that. I am not that person, like, when I lead you to Jesus, I, like, I am not going to sit here and say, well, now everything's rainbows and unicorns. Everything's going to be great. Everything's going to be wonderful. No, man, get, get, buckle up for the ride of your life. But you always have a promise. You always know the end. It doesn't matter how bad it looks. You always know the end. When you're in his will. When you're in his will. Um, okay. So it may not always be easy. It may actually be very challenging. And at times it may look devastating. When you're trying to make your decision based on the word. But it will never Never, somebody say never, never steer you in the wrong direction. Your decision based on his word, on his truth, will always prove true. Psalms 119, 105 says this. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Are you confused? Look into the word and ask Holy Spirit to give you a word to clarify. Feel like things are going in the wrong direction? Ask Holy Spirit, give you a word to bring direction. Feel like you're stuck in a dark cloud? Ask Holy Spirit to give you a word to bring in the light. Here's the thing, this entire room, Pastor Tony touched on this in one of his messages recently. This entire room could be completely dark. And I could turn on my flashlight of my cell phone. There's now light. In that huge dark room, now there's light. It's the same way when you bring in the word of God. It just, well, then the darkness can't be. Darkness and light can't be in the same place. The heart is unstable. It changes based on the slightest of things. A look, an attitude, the temperature, the environment, the season, Certain times of the month, ladies. Can I get an amen, brothers? I'm helping you out a little bit. Sweet and salty snacks, brothers. Sweet and salty snacks. That's, that's all it takes. So the heart is unstable. And a nap. Let them get a nap. The heart is unstable. It changes based on the slightest of things. One day it could be the best idea ever, and the next day you could think it's the worst idea ever. Faith home. It could be, stay another six months? Oh, wait, no, that's okay. Nope, I could do this, and it'll give me time to save up, and then I'll be able to do this, and they're going to help me make this transition so I don't just jump ship and think I can do it on my own. And then you get corrected on something. What? You want me to stay here six months? No, you're just trying to be controlling. You just want me to be here. You don't want me to leave, do you? Look, congregation sounds the same way. I'm just going to put it out there. He's over in the parking lot. Who do you think I am? Anyway, that's not in my notes. Um. It's unstable, and it can be based on whether or not someone accepts or rejects you. Faith home, it can be based on family visiting or not visiting. The calls going, uh, the calls going home going well or not so well. It is unstable and unreliable. The word of God is stable. It is reliable, and it's unchanging for thousands of years. Let me show you. They're not going to pull this up because it's a bunch of scripture. But in Genesis 1, verses 3 through 26, 
in verses 3, 5, 6, 8, 10, 11, 14, 20, 24, and 26. I hope you all wrote those down. I did it as the micro machine man trying to test your ability to take notes. <laughs> You're right. That's right. Study for yourself. It notes that. It notes this. That either God said, God called out of his mouth. God said, God called. And all of creation was made. The word from the beginning. His word created what we now see as the world with land and sea. Sky, stars, plants, animals on land and water and sea and air, the sun, the moon, human beings. It was his word then. And let me tell you that according to Hebrews, it's his word now that's upholding it all. Hebrews 1.3 says this. Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things... By the word of his power. This scripture is referencing Jesus being the express image of God's glory and the image of him in person. And notes that God is now currently in 2024 upholding all things by the word of his power. The same commentary I referenced earlier noted this. Upholding is not a passive holding something up, but of actively sustaining it is a consistent work in relation to the world. Meaning this, that he is upholding it all now. But how? By the word of his power, by his word. The worlds were created by the word of his power and are being held together by it now. The very atoms that are holding that chair together that you're sitting on are being upheld by the word of his power. If he were to lift his hand off creation right now, we would all get burned up by the sun and die. If not expire because the breath in our lungs would be gone. When he spoke creation, it existed in that moment and now exists for us today. That's reliability. There's no Honda that that's reliable. <laughs> Pastor Elliot, I'm sorry. <laughs> creation was the beginning for us of the reliability of his word, and we live in that reliability. Currently, let me show you that his word endures to the very last moment to come. Go to Revelation 19, 13. Hi, Ellie. I'm glad you're here tonight. Revelation 19, 13. It says this. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called what? That was really sad and depressing. His name is called what? The Word of God. One more time. His name is called what? The Word of God. There it is. Good morning. Welcome. <laughs> From beginning to end, it's his word. From Genesis to Revelation, he reveals himself and the power of his word. I challenge you. This is amazing. I challenge you. Go through and study any mention of the word, of precepts, judgments, testimonies, commandments, law in the Bible. Realize all of those references refer to the word of God. Refer to the Bible. Start in Psalms. It'll blow you away. One final thought as you uh, chew on all of this. When you're deciding whether or not to allow your heart or the word of God direct your decisions. 2 Timothy 3.16 says this. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. In your decision-making process, you must allow the word of God to bring correction to wrong thinking, to motivations, to emotions. You must allow it to instruct you in the way you should go, not the way you think you should go. 
the way of righteousness, and you must allow it to challenge you in your decisions. Most decisions are going to cost you something. Obedience is not cheap. It requires self-sacrifice and surrender of the mind, will, emotions, and body. Let me close and say this to you on one final thought. Don't allow your heart to use scripture in a way that justifies your wrong decisions. I'm going to say it again. Don't allow your heart to use scripture in a way that justifies your wrong decisions. He'll let you know. He'll let you know when it's, when it's being done that way. We are not to prostitute the word of God. We are not to use it for our own satisfaction. The word is to bring correction. The word is to be so we look in the mirror and we look at ourselves before we start pointing fingers at anybody else. Stand with me. Praise the Lord for Russell. Amen. Listen, I challenge you, before I hand it over for uh, Pastor Tony for everything, um, I challenge you to go through the word and look those words up. Look up precepts, testimonies, law, commandments, the word. Look up where God said when he spoke. And challenge yourself to really put pressure on the word. No, this was not fire. No, this was not like, ah, but this is where we need to be because otherwise we're going to hear things through the news, through TV, through YouTube, through other places, even through us if you're not careful, and you'll be led astray. You have to know what the word says. So the primary reason is so that when the enemy comes and situations and circumstances start turning in the opposite direction that your heart's desire and the will of God is for, you know how to combat it. Because if not, you'll start attacking a person. You'll start attacking your family. You'll start attacking your boss. You'll start attacking your children. But when you get the word on it, Right? We sing this song, but we just get hype over songs, and it drives me crazy. Do you really have that sword in your mouth? Do you really have the word of God in your mouth? Are you really ready to take out the word and go to battle in the spirit, or is it just a good beat and some words that get you hyped up in your body? It's time to really get the sword in your mouth. It's time to really go after the enemy on the word of God for your family, for your children, for this nation, for this region, for this church. If we don't know the word, we'll get taken out by any wind of doctrine. Be like the people we met with. Search it out. Go find out. It's in there, and he wants to reveal it. But never use the scripture just to satisfy your own desires and try to prove yourself right when the Lord is really trying to correct you. Amen? Amen.